Ladies and gentlemen, I want to share a vision with you. A vision about the forthcoming technical revolution powered by evolutionary technology. Now, I realize that you probably never thought of evolution as a technology, but it is. It's a tool that helps us solve problems. Let me illustrate this with an example. It is a very well-known problem, the traveling salesman problem, who has to visit a number of cities in a tour and return to the headquarters. And he has to do it in the shortest possible way. The problem is easy to tell, but very hard to solve because there are so many different trips. If he had to visit the 41 European capitals, then the number of different trips would be that big that we needed 50 digits, 10 to the power of 94, to write that number down. No wonder that traditional problem solvers cannot guarantee a solution without, within an acceptable time. This opens up the field for non-conventional solution methods. My favorite non-conventional method is based on Darwinian principles. The basic idea is that we breed a solution and not calculate or derive one. This was a hugely radical idea back in the 1970s. But once you accept the basics, the rest is quite straightforward. All you need to do is oversimplify evolution and reduce it to three basic components. These are fitness evaluation, reproduction, and selection. The notion of fitness here is the one we know from survival of the fittest. In problem solving, fitness always stands for solution quality. For a traveling salesman, a short tour would be fit and a long tour would be not fit. As for reproduction, we need to make the computational equivalence of mutation and crossover. In both cases, heredity is very important. The children must inherit properties of both parents with some random variations. Taking the proverbial couple, father and mother, one of them being beautiful and the other one being intelligent, and I'm not telling you who is what, their child could be beautiful and intelligent, but it could also be ugly and stupid. <laughs> and therefore, we need selection to guarantee quality. As it happens, selection comes in two flavors. We have parent selection, which chooses the best individuals for reproduction. And we have survival selection, which chooses the best individuals to populate the next generation. Once we put it all together, we obtain an evolutionary problem solver. The first generation we have to make by hand. And for the traveling salesman, that would be a bunch of random tours through Europe. And then we push the start button, and we get a process of gradual improvement. In terms of evolution, the population is getting fitter and fitter. In terms of problem solving, the solutions are getting better and better, until we get a population which contains extremely good solutions, perhaps even the best ever possible. Now, this is really amazing. This is a blind technology. It has no intelligence whatsoever. It has no understanding of the problem. It has no insights into the factors that determine quality and it can solve very hard problems. Initially, this came as a great surprise to the scientists. There was much skepticism, but then the evidence started to come in. There was this university in the UK that implemented an evolutionary timetabling system. They evolved timetables for all campuses, all lecturers, all lecturers, all students, all courses. And the evolved timetables were much better than anything they had had before. Or take this Dutch bank that made evolutionary systems producing prediction systems that tells them what the customers will be doing in the future. They had historical data, they knew what the customers were doing in the past, and they evolved models that would tell them what the customers will be doing in the future. Over time, the evidence became overwhelming, and no, there were no theoretical guarantees of always finding the optimal solution. No, there were no crisp borders of applicability of this technology. And no, there were no mathematical calculations of the minimal necessary steps. But yes, there were excellent solutions. So by the year 2000, 
the new field was born, evolutionary computing became respectable. Now, I consider this as a major transition. Before evolutionary computing, evolution was a passive notion. It was a principle that explained us something that had happened in the past, the emergence of life on Earth. With the invention of the computers, we could create our own worlds and start our own evolutionary processes in the future. Of course, all these processes took place in the digital space, inside the computer, while real evolution takes place on Earth, in the biological space. And therefore, this was also a transition from the biological space to the digital space, or for short, from veteran to software. I dare to call this a revolution. This completely changed the way we think about evolution. It enabled us to set up our own evolutionary processes and play around with it. We invented and tested different kinds of evolvable objects. We invented and tested different kinds of mutation and crossover operators, including ones that do not exist on Earth. For instance, I was doing research for years on reproduction operators that require more than two parents. Over time, we gained an awful lot of expertise, knowledge, and know-how about this technology. And we could identify three essential properties of it. To begin with, evolution is a real good problem solver. It can solve problems we do not fully understand, and we cannot even crisply specify. Second, it can cope with change. In principle, it can happen, and in practice it does happen, that the circumstances and or the user requirements change during problem solving. For most problem solvers, this is lethal, but not for evolution. It can leverage on the diversity of solutions in the population and random effects, and it solves the new problem. And third, creativity. But for this one, I have a little illustration so that you can see it with your own eyes. This is one of the evolutionary computing classics. It shows you the development of solutions to an engineering problem, where the problem is to design a jet nozzle for an airplane with the maximum possible thrust. And as you see, the evolution from poor to good to very good solutions ends in something very strange. The best solutions are completely irregular. They do not follow any human logic, symmetry, or aesthetical judgment, but they are very, very good. And here, we touch upon something essential. Evolution is so powerful because it does not follow the human patterns of thinking. It can think outside of the box, and it is not afraid to explore many different ideas blindly. To show you a biological example, I want to do a little experiment with you. I ask you all to close your eyes and imagine a very strange animal, a real non-existing animal. It does not have to be dangerous, but it must be strange. Did you visualize one yet? Then you can open your eyes and watch the one on the big screen. This is a well-known classic example of the chimera invented thousands of years ago. And it is certainly a non-existing animal. You could even say it is a strange animal. But I would definitely not say that it is an original animal. Actually, it is just a composition of existing parts of existing animals. And I'm afraid this would be true for all those animals you have just imagined for yourself. Real evolution can be more creative than humans. Before the discovery of Australia, nobody imagined an animal with a pouch. And this is why I consider the kangaroo as a metaphor for the creativity of evolution. It represents all those original, unexpected solutions evolution can come up with. Having all this knowledge, all this expertise, all the know-how about evolution, today we are heading towards a second major transition. And while the birth of evolutionary computing went pretty much unnoticed for most people, this one will change our lives beyond imagination. The best way to introduce my argument is to ask the question, does evolution ever come out of the computer? The answer is no. 
it never comes out by itself? And the answer is yes. We can construct and manufacture the end result in reality afterwards. Actually, I have two friends who have a piece of evolutionary furniture in their living rooms. Mark in Paris has a chair, and Peter in London has a coffee table. Of course, they are both evolutionary computing scientists. They had the capacity and the means to conduct a whole evolutionary design process. They started with a random population of drawings. They had the computer do the mutation and the crossover of those drawings. And they were doing the selection themselves. They judged every single new child drawing on the screen, selecting the ones they liked. Over many generations, they got a nice drawing, which they passed to a carpenter. Here is the result. Just to be sure, the picture on the right-hand side is the chair. This trick with evolutionary design can be done with many different kinds of objects. Industrial objects, household objects, even pieces of art. But in all cases, we are restricted to conduct evolution inside the computer and only construct the end result. But wouldn't it be much better and logical to keep it all together and have evolution outside in the wild, in the real world? This would open up an avenue of new technology, which I call embodied artificial evolution. I really believe that this will be the next big thing, big, big thing. This will mean that we are evolving tangible objects in real time and real space. And of course, this will require reproduction of physical objects which sounds like science fiction, because after all, nobody has ever seen two chairs mating and producing a baby chair. <laughs> but we are much closer to a solution than you might think. At the moment, the problem of reproducting artifacts is being attacked from at least three different angles. Chemists try it bottom up, starting with small molecules, making them bigger and bigger, complexer, until they become self-replicating. Biologists work the other way around. They start with a living cell and they slip it down to the max to make it programmable and controllable while still self-replicating. And then you have the roboticists and material scientists who attack head-on, trying to engineer some high-tech solution perhaps based on 3D printers. I believe that a breakthrough between five and 10 years from now is possible. So imagine that the technology is here. Can we do anything useful with it? Before you say no very quickly, think back of the 1940s when the first computers were built. That was the decade when an IBM executive thought there would be a world market for maybe five computers altogether. And 60 or 70 years later, there are more computing devices on Earth than human beings. And these were invented after we started to build computers. So I believe that the real applications of the new technology will be invented after we start using the technology. Today, we can only speculate. So let me show you three very speculative examples. To begin with, why don't we evolve robots instead of engineering and building and programming them? We could send a colony of robots to a planet, equipping them with the ability to evolve. They would adjust to that environment, learn to survive, and build us a house before we come. There are also many applications in search and rescue, farming, or security. There are even applications uh, in the West domestic area, we could have a bunch of artificial pets or servants around us, keeping us company and helping with the domestic tasks. We could also go down the scale and try to engineer things on the micro and the nano level. These would be biomedical applications. What about a personal virus scanner? This could be implemented by a group of robots inside your body, evolving to your own metabolism, learning your body, and protecting it against invaders 
germs or cancer. And finally, the long-lasting dream of the personal fabricator. Imagine a biggish device in your home, something like a huge American refrigerator, that could make stuff for you. It could make you sunglasses, handbags, T-shirts, coffee mugs. It could make you stuff to your specification. But it could also surprise you with some random evolutionary design. And you will be the fitness evaluator here. You would judge each object, rate them, and give five stars for the T-shirt and two for the handbag. So the system would evolve to you, learn your taste, and make you personalized objects. And while we are thinking big, why not connect all these devices on Earth? Then we would get something which should be called the Internet of Things. Evolutionary app stores on a, on a global scale. Amazing possibilities. So is this science? Is this fiction? Today it is more the latter. But I believe that in one to two decades, there will be this new industrial revolution, and our environments will be populated by artificially evolved objects. What would this mean for us? On the local scale, for you and me back home, this would mean an unprecedented level of personalization and customization. On the global scale, for mankind as a whole, this would mean a diversity of objects we have never had before. And this diversity, in turn, will facilitate evolvability and creativity. And it will give us unexpected original objects. Many, many tech kangaroos. I can hardly wait. Thank you. Thank you.